What up, my wizards? It's Dev, SBMTG. We like it a magic, all that stuff. You know the whole spiel by now. And we got some more Theros Beyond Death spoilers and preview cards for you there today. And I want to go ahead and jump right in as soon as we can because we missed yesterday. Family stuff, don't worry about it. It's, it's fine. I'm actually really excited <laughs> to talk about all these cards that we missed and the stuff from today because some of the stuff from today is like amazing. But in any case, let's go ahead and get to it with Meyer Triton, sort of just going in chronological order, starting with what we missed first. And this is actually a sweet little card. Two mana, one and a black for a 2-1 zombie merfolk with death touch. And when it ETBs, you put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard, and you gain two life. The Meyer is fire. This is actually a sweet little card right here that does all kinds of stuff. You know, I'm looking for another really decent black two drop. And although we did see a good little legendary creature the other day, that's a pretty decent black two drop in and of itself. I think this also adds to what we can do in certain decks, especially reanimator decks and whatnot. But this is going to be great for escaping cards. You know, there's all kinds of decks where putting two cards into your graveyard from your library is almost a draw too you know you can jump start something escape something reanimated whatever so putting two cards in your graveyard is fantastic for a wide variety of decks and just gaining a little bit of life really sweet too in a lot of decks you know if you're trying to sort of withstand the initial onslaught of aggro this is pretty nice you know just a two mana two one that gains you two life when it etbs actually wouldn't be too bad but you slap death touch on it can take down creatures way bigger than it and hold off whole battlefields you know it's an answer to love struck beast all kinds of stuff i really really like what this is doing plus it's got two really good creature types too so yeah, I actually think that this is a really sweet card, and I think people are sort of undervaluing it right now. I want to know if it does anything, so we'll see about it. I really like Triton, but let's get on to the Birth of Melitus. This is two mana, one, and a white for a saga. On Chapter 1, you search your library for a basic planes, reveal it, put it in your hand, shuffle your library. On Chapter 2, you create a 0-4 colorless wall artifact creature token with Defender. And then on Chapter 3, you gain 2 life. So, I actually think that this is pretty decent too, another card that's sort of being undervalued. It just does so much stuff, you know, thins your library, searches for a planes, a little bit of mana fixing. I mean, the ability to go get a land on Turn 2 or beyond is actually... A lot better than, than many people give it credit for just, just then and there. But it does way more than that. You know, it creates a 0-4 on turn two. So it's kind of a wall of omens, you know, a 0-4 that draws you, effectively draws you a card. But also gains you two life, so another good card for effectively getting into the late and mid-game against these aggro decks. And I'm not sure aggro is going to be too much of a problem one way or the other. But <laughs> those blocks are sort of non-aggro, you know, mid-rangey creatures too. So I don't know. It could do a lot. I like that it's a saga. You know, we're um, we're going into a sort of Enchantments Matters standard meta, or at least an Enchantment Matters set, right? So there's going to be a bunch of cards that want us to have Enchantments in the graveyard, and I think Sagas are a pretty elegant solution to that. And this one does so much, it's so utility, that I could see it seeing some play here or there. You know, especially in some sort of just uber defensive or even, you know, sort of turbo fog kind of deck. This would be a decent card, but it's not as bad as a lot of people are saying it is. Let me just throw that out there. I'd probably rather have Wall of Omens, though, <laughs> all things considered. But you really got to take into account the synergy, and this card will probably contribute to a lot of synergy in the upcoming format. But let's move on to Ashiok's Erasure. I've seen people freak out about this card. Um, when the leaks happened, we saw this, and there were a few MTG YouTubers that made videos about this card specifically. This was four mana, two and two blue for an enchantment with flash and when it etbs you exile target spell your opponents can't cast spells with the same name as the exiled card and when ashiok's erasure leaves the battlefield you return the exiled card to its owner's hand that last line of text i think makes the card not so great especially considering it's kind of a four mana counter spell and four mana counter spells have to be very very good so what you get here is, I guess it's kind of a sort of an Ixalan's binding or an effect similar to that where like you counter the spell, they can't, they just can't play that card again. And it gets around like, you know, can't be countered conditions and stuff because you're not actually countering the spell, you're just exiling it. So maybe on the play you can deal with shifting Ceratops, but that's like, you know, I really don't see the card going much further than like that application in standard. Although again, we're, we're in a format coming up where enchantments matter. So the fact that this just has the card type enchantment might be decent you know if the mono blue devotion deck is more of a control deck that wants to play at instant speed i can see stuff like this being really really good so we'll see another flash enchantment in blue um coming up so i think you could make the argument that the mono blue devotion deck will mostly be flash cards if they can help it so this probably goes in there but at the very least it's a sideboard option on the play against ceratops and that's 
probably good enough to see some standard play, but the sky's not falling or anything. It's not, it's not an incredible card. <laughs> Let's move on. Also, one more thing on the play against like fires. That's probably good, right? But so many decks run enchantment hate right now. Um, and even more so, I imagine going into the next format, so many decks run main deck enchantment hate that stuff like this is a little wobbly. Let me just put it that way. But let's move on to Satessin Pioneer here. This is a functional upgrade to a card that already existed. This is three mana, two green, and, a, and one for a 2-2 two, two human druid. And when it ETBs, you gain life equal to your devotion, two green. So the prior version of this is four mana and has an extra point of PT. So this isn't like strictly better or anything, but in terms of like competitive magic, usually the lower mana cost is almost always better. Almost always better. Now, against aggro, you might rather have a 3-3, three, three, but against aggro, you might not even be, even be able to get to the point in the game where you can cast a four-mana card. So, <laughs> it's especially in, like, modern and stuff. So, and effects like this have seen play in modern before, uh, in sideboards against burn and whatnot. So, I could see this actually seeing some play outside of standard, but in standard, too, this is another good candidate for, like, really playable sideboard card, or even main deck card, you know? We got stuff like... Yorvo and even like Barkhide Troll in the format, that's two green devotion. Plus, you know, even like stuff like Gilded Goose, you know, play on turn one or Edgewall Innkeeper even. So it's really not hard to get your devotion going in the early game in green. But then once you get in the late game, you know, past Yorvo, you got stuff like Questing Beast and Vivian, the four mana Vivian, that's three green pips for devotion. So yeah, yeah, so Tessin Pioneer might actually come down and gain you like eight life <laughs> pretty easily. And that's really good against not just aggro, but even a lot of mid range decks. So I can see Satessin Pioneer being actually like main deckable depending on the format, but at the very least sideboardable. So let's move on to Glimpse of Freedom here. This is two mana, one and a blue for an instant draw card. And you can escape it for two and a blue and exile five other cards from your yard, which is a lot. But if you're not really doing too much other escapey stuff or stuff that requires you to, you know, use your graveyard and control, you'll probably play a copy or two of this card. At least the one, you know, it's sort of reminiscent of Think Twice, obviously. And Think Twice is a pretty good magic card in standard control decks uh, of the time, and even sometimes beyond standard. You know, we've seen Think Twice in modern once or twice. So I definitely see this as a take on Think Twice, like just being playable in standard. So, I mean, I don't really have much more to say about it other than like, yeah, this is one that people aren't like super excited about, but like they're at least acknowledging that it's somewhat playable and there's not much more you can say about it than that. You know, whether or not this is better than some other instant speed card draw effects that we affect that we have right now is remains to be seen, but you know, in like the draw two decks that play Iron Crag Pyromancer and whatnot, I'd rather play something like this than say Anticipate or Shimmer of Possibility cards that don't technically draw you a card. Whereas this does, you know. But eh, whether it's better than like Radical Idea remains to be seen. I could see it being as good as Radical Idea, and if it is, that means it's standard playable. So, yeah, fine card. <laughs> Glimpse of Freedom is. Let's move on to Sweet Oblivion, which is reminiscent, because it only it costs two mana and has an escape clause, but anyway, this is one in a blue for a sorcery with some of the coolest art in the entire set. And it's target player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard. You can escape it for three in a blue and exile four cards from your graveyard. So this is really cute um, in that. First of all, yeah, mill decks might play it. You can escape it over and over if you have the fuel to do it, all that. But what I want to do is have enough mana to just cast this a, a, a million times, like mill through your entire deck. You know, if you had infinite mana, you could probably do a lot more cooler things. But if you did have infinite mana, you could just cast this, mill yourself four cards and then escape it. Mill yourself four cards, escape it, mill yourself the four cards you just milled yourself. So you could go through your entire deck if you had enough mana and then went off of Laboratory Maniac or the four mana Jace that's in standard right now. So there are some really cool things that can be done with this. Or just like increase your storm count, increase your prowess count if you got a bunch of creatures that care about you casting spells, you know. I can see how this might be okay. You're hitting like Narcomoebas and Creeping Chills the whole time. You're milling yourself. So maybe there's some like really fun, janky like shell this fits into. But that'll, that'll probably be the end of it. Like I'm not sure this even goes in the standard mill decks if it was instant speed we might be talking but there's just way better stuff and that deck is stacked with two drops right now anyway so i'm not even sure the deck that it looks like it goes into wants it this looks more like a sort of combo piece for decks that want to sort of go infinite and just turn their entire library into the graveyard but of course you're exiling cards as you go so it's not like you always have access to the cards that you're milling into your yard but i don't know maybe when you finally hit the cards you want to hit with it that's when you stop 
You know, there's there's all kinds of stuff you could do with Oblivion, so I'm interested in it. I want to see what people do. But let's move on to Dalakos, Crafter of Wonders. This is three mana, one, a blue, and a red for a 2-4 legendary. Um, hold on, I've just gotten some sort of pop-up on my computer. Thank you, Norton. Thank you, Norton Security Scan. <laughs> this is three mana, is it colors and a colorless for a 2-4 legendary Merfolk Artificer. I was at the creature types. That's where we left off. You can tap it for two colorless, but you can spend that only to cast artifact spells or activate um, activated abilities of artifacts. So it's renowned weaponsmith in that regard. And equipped creatures you control have flying as well as haste. So it's a super renowned weapon smith. And I could actually see them going in the same deck really well. It's a cool like artificer commander. You know, maybe maybe you play this in commander, but even in standard, this has like decent blocking stats. And this can ramp you into like really big artifacts and stuff. Like maybe it goes in a Karn deck of some kind, but it also goes really well with like Embercleave. You know, like maybe the Is It Flash decks will start playing copies of this, but I really doubt it. The only reason I say that is because Is It Flash has started sideboarding Embercleaves, and some people are putting them in the main deck. So, considering this goes so well with Embercleave and it's on color with Embercleave, and if you do put Cleave on something, it has flying. <laughs> it seems, that seems all of this seems crazy, but I'm still not sure that it's worth the slot in those decks, but there's probably something cool you can do with it. But let's move on to Reverent Hoplite. I'm not sure if this card is good or not. Honestly, this is five mana, four and a, and a white for a one, two human soldier. And when it ETBs, you create a number of one, one white human creature, soldier creature tokens, excuse me, equal to your devotion to white. So you're at least getting two creatures if you play this for five mana and you have a completely empty board, but you're only getting like you know, two, three worth of stats in that situation. That's one of the reasons I don't, care for this card you know a card like gary which this is somewhat comparable to obviously a five mana devotion etb trigger you know um gary has decent stats you know like gary's a, f a fine blocking body you know five mana for a two four wouldn't normally be decent stats but considering the etb trigger the stats are fine this the stats are terrible you know you get a one two that's really bad <laughs> that's, that's very very bad but then again i guess if you have like a daxos and a Linden, you know, like in, in the best case scenario, you might get like 10 tokens off of this. And then it's really, really good, you know, but is it better than, I don't know, Venerated Loxodon or something at the top end of your curve? Is it? And like Venerated Loxodon doesn't even cost you five, 95% of the time that you play it. Usually Venerated Loxodon costs you zero to three, you know, forever and Hoplite's always going to cost you five. So... I don't know, especially in a format so rich with sweepers right now. I'm just not sure that this is exactly where you want to be, but I mean, <laughs> prove me wrong, you know. In limited, this might be a bomb that puts six tokens on the battlefield in the late game and you just win. So it's a fine card, but I'm not sure that it really breaks the ceiling into, you know, high tier standard play. But let's move on to Chainweb Arachnir. I actually tweeted about this little guy yesterday. I'm taking a sip of coffee. Numb. I think that this isn't a super powerful card, but I do think it might be a standard playable card, at least in sideboards. This is just one green mana for a 1-2 spider with reach, and when it ETBs, it deals damage equal to its power to target creature with flying and opponent controls. You can escape it for 3 and 2 green and exile 4 of the cards from your yard, and it escapes with 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, so that's nice, you know? It escapes as a 4-5. And kills all kinds of stuff, you know, Sphinx of Foresight and on down. Hate that it doesn't kill Cavalier of Gales, but it does kill almost every important flying creature in the format when it escapes. And then, you know, just the first time you play it, there's actually a fair amount of action. You know, it kills Healer's Hawks and Spectral Sailors and a couple of other creatures in the format right now that you might have to worry about here and there, you know. It also can kill, like, Brazen Borrowers the turn it comes into play um, when you just play it for one green mana and that's pretty decent. Also, it doesn't fight the creature, you know, like Crawl Harpooner fights the creature. This just deals damage equal to its power so you don't have to worry about it dying. That's pretty sweet. You know, it's got two toughness so it sticks around to block anything that it didn't kill. Um, and sometimes that can be really good, you know, kill a healer's hawk, stick around to block a healer's hawk. Oh, it's fine. So, <laughs> I actually think Chain Web is great and then like if you escape it later in the game after it does die, even if it doesn't kill a flying creature, you still, like, you got a 4-5. That's not bad. So I think the chain web is actually, like, really sweet, but I don't see it seeing much play outside of, you know, mono green sideboards, where it might see some play. You know, if Terramander comes back or something, this could be a pretty sweet answer. So I like it. I do. But I'm, I'm not sure that it's, like, what I want to be talking about for 20 minutes. So let's move on to Pensive Pious Propensity is the Scryfall name for this card. I'm 
pretty sure that's not the actual name for it, but it's a sorcery. It costs five mana, three and Orzhov colors. You can choose one or both. Return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield or and or return target aura card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So that's pretty cute, you know? You return a creature card from your graveyard, slap it on the battlefield, and then put an aura on it that gives it haste. Or something like that. That, that would be pretty cool, you know? <laughs> and we'll have to wait and see, like, what kind of insane auras we get in this set. Hopefully more than we've seen so far. Because it's the aura clause on this that I really, really like. Otherwise, it's just kind of a worse Bond of Revival. And Bond of Revival doesn't see much play in the first place. So, I want to be excited about the reanimation clause on the first half of this card. But it's really the second half that's going to determine whether or not the card is good. So, I mean, we're really kind of waiting on evaluation here. Because there's not a ton of R's in standard right now that make this, like, super playable, right? So, if it was just return target enchantment, that would be pretty decent. You know, get a saga back or something, but it's got to be an aura, and for that, I, I've got to see some more cards. <laughs> Let's move on to Nessian Boar here. This is five mana, three and two green for a 10-6 boar. <laughs> Some pretty good stats. And all creatures able to block Nessian Boar do so. It's got a built-in lure. And whenever it becomes blocked by a creature, that creature's controller draws a card. So that's kind of interesting. And a couple of basic combos here are Narset. So your opponent can only ever draw one card off of it. Seems good. And then um, Nissa, or not Nissa, I always want to say Nissa. Um, Vivian, the four mana Vivian, can both give this trample and allow it to deal damage equal to its power to stuff. So, you know, it's 10 power, can kill pretty much anything on the table. And then get in, and your opponent will have less blockers for it, less ways to draw cards. So, a couple of decent modes on Vivian for it. Tweeted about that last night, too. But there's also stupid stuff like Pass Wall Adept. You know, just make it unblockable. <laughs> there's all kinds of ways to do that. Just make it unblockable, swing for 10. You can also fling it, you know, deal 10 damage. So there's a lot of fun ways to use this card in standard right now. I'm not sure that it's going to get real, really any play at all, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> Just because at five mana, we've already got Nyssa in green and Cavalier of Thorns. Just all kinds of better options to play for five mana. Like I might even rather play like Biogenic Ooze in this card. But if you're trying to do like fun stuff, yes, to this. Yes, play, play that card. I'm not sure that it actually like meets the bar when it comes to other green five drops, but when it comes to fun, there's all kinds of stupid crap you can do with it, and you will be seeing it in the dank jank one way or the other. But let's move on to Farika's spawn here. This is four mana. Three and a black for a three four Gorgon. Good creature type. Escape six, five and a black. Exile three other cards from your yard. Farika's spawn escapes with two plus one plus one counters on it. When it enters the battlefield this way, each opponent sacrifices a non-Gorgon creature, so when it escapes, it kind of feels like um, Farika, honestly, or like Hythonio the Cruel, something like that, you know? And I really like those cards, so <laughs> sweet callback, but can we get like a Gorgon Lord, you know? Like, this is the set for it. Can we get a legendary? It doesn't even have to be legendary. Just some sort of Gorgon Lord that anthems your other Gorgons or give you some other, you know, benefit for having Gorgons in play. I just, I like, I love the Gorgon creature type, and I'd love to have like a real... A real lord for it, but this is a fine card in limited, especially unless your opponent has a particularly wide board, you know, they cast their the white Gary, you know, and they've gotten six tokens or whatever. This card's pretty bad in that situation, but in a lot of board states, this will be pretty decent because it effectively acts as a Necrotal or a Shriek Maw, or Ravenous Chupacabra, just whatever creature you want to compare it to. This kills something when it escapes in ETBs, and you get a pretty big thing too, you know, you got fat stats. Uh, five six when this escapes um and it's not terribly statted when you first play it so you're kind of daring your opponent to kill it you know you can swing with it indiscriminately or just like leave it up to block and dare your opponent to kill it so that you can escape it <laughs> you know there's all kinds of fun things you can do it and i think it's a really sweet card but again against wide boards it doesn't look super great but it doesn't go beyond limited but it does have some pretty good limited applications but let's move on to do we have the name of this card uh, scryfall has it as lolf Lolf. I don't. I don't think that that's actually the name of the card. What is it called on Mythic Spoiler? Hold on. I'm not even going to show you the card yet. Arasta of Endless Webs is what Mythic Spoiler is calling it. This is four mana, two and two green for a three five legendary enchantment creature, Spider, with Reach. And whenever an opponent casts an instant or sorcery spell, you create a one two green Spider creature token with Reach. Now. Honestly, I want to be really excited about this because it's a legendary spider and like, can we get spider tribal going in standard? Oh, we see two spiders today. Maybe we can do it. 
maybe we can do it. Spider tribal would be awesome. I, I love, I hate spiders in real life. I'm very afraid of them, but I love, <laughs> I love spider tribal <laughs> in magic and I want it to happen. But in terms of like play a actual real playability, I'm not sure how much I like this card in the card pool that we have right now, you know, four mana in green is a really, really high bar. You know, stuff like Questing Beast, Shifting Ceratops, and Shifting Ceratops is probably better against the control decks than this is. And this looks like an anti-control card of some kind. Or maybe it's an anti-combo piece if there's like a really instant or sorcery-centric combo deck in the format right now. This might be an anti-combo piece, but I'm still not sure. You know, there's a bunch of green four drops, and I haven't even mentioned like Vivian you could play, you know, Wicked Wolf you could play instead of this. Again, just too many good green four drops to really consider this unless you're against the exact right deck, so it's probably relegated to the sideboard. It's legendary, so you can't have multiples of it out. You know, it's dependent on what your opponent is doing, so it's not going to be good at all against a lot of decks. It dies to Questing Beast. I should point that out, too, while not killing Questing Beast itself. So I just, again, I think there's just too many, like, you know, kind of gotchas in the format against this card. So not a, not as big a fan as I want to be, despite how cool the art and creature typing are. Um, this card's going to have to prove itself, and I think it's got a long way to go before it can do that. But maybe after Shifting Ceratops rotates, it'll do some work. But let's move on to Warden of the Chained. Three mana, one, a red, and a green for a 4-4 Minotaur Warrior with Trample. Those are very good stats. And it can't attack unless you control another creature with power four or greater, which really should not be too hard <laughs> in these Gruul decks, you know? Whether it's... Got anything from Gruul Spellbreaker to Questing Beast to Skargan Elkite, even in some of these decks, or even just a Zerta Goblin or another three power creature that's been equipped with an Ember Cleave, for instance. <laughs> it's just, or maybe you have multiples of Warden out at the same time and suddenly they activate one another. So this is actually pretty decent, but is it as good as some of the other Gruul three drops? Not sure, you know, not only do we have Thrashing Bronson on, it's probably the weakest of the chain, but we've got Gruul Spellbreaker, which you don't cut. And now we've got Xenagos. Um, or not, not Xenagos, Cloth is the one that replaces Xenagos. So, so I'm not really sure that we have the room for this. And it's, I mean, it's a pile of stats. It's really good stats for the mana cost, but it's just a pile of stats. That's not good when it's by itself on the board. So I'm not sure this breaks through in a standard, despite what it looks like. You know, it looks like, oh my God, a Loxodon Smiter, right? But it's, it's just not. So uh, we'll have to see. It's probably decent in limited, but again, in limited, when it's just by itself on the board, it's terrible. So. Uh, it can still block, you know, it's got the Lovestruck Beast text box. <laughs> it, can, it can block, so that might make a huge difference, but we'll have to, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it really meets the power level requirement of a Gruul 3 drop in standard at the moment, but it might, it might. But let's move on to one of my favorite, we're getting into the real stuff. Uh, <laughs> here we go. Here's Blood Aspirant. This is uh, two mana, one and a red for a 1-1 one, one Seder Berserker. We're getting more Seders, y'all, for the for the Seder Lord we just saw. Whenever you sacrifice a permanent, put a plus one, plus one counter on Blood Aspirant. You can pay one and a red and tap it. By the way, there doesn't have to be more to this text box. That's that's all that needs to be there. But you can pay one a red and tap it and sacrifice a creature or enchantment to have Aspirant deal one damage to target creature, and that creature can't block this turn. This is all so good. <laughs> this is really good, you know? No longer. Do the red black sacrifice decks have to play one to four copies of Mask of Immolation? And those days are gone. This is both a a creature, you know, just like Mask of Immolation, both a creature and a sacrifice outlet, which is the whole reason that people played a card as, as low quality, let's face it, as Mask of Immolation in the black red sacrifice decks in the first place. This gives us something that grows whenever we sacrifice not only a cat. But, you know, the food token to bring the cat back. So this grows plus two, plus two every single turn in the cat loop, which is freaking insane. But if, you know, it did Fable Passage, this grows to Fable Passage, which makes it ridiculous in and of itself. If you sacrifice two other creatures to a priest of forgotten gods, this gets plus two, plus two right then and there, too. So there's just so much. There is just so much. Even in the Jun Sacrifice deck, you sacrifice food to Trail of Crumbs. You sacrifice food to make mana with a Gilded Goose. This gets a little bit bigger. That's crazy. You know, you sacrifice stuff for Corvold. This gets a little bit better. Sacrifice stuff to Vraska. This gets better. So 
Ooh, I'm telling you, it doesn't look like much considering it just starts at a 1-1 for two mana, which is a terrible raid, but this will get to 5-5 five, five, like relatively quickly in a lot of these decks, especially if you're able to start the game with a Gilded Goose or start the game with Cat plus Witch's Oven. Yeah, this, it's just an insane card. This is a very good card that we'll see play in Standard, y'all. <laughs> especially considering I don't see a whole lot of sacrifice synergy so far in the set at large, so it doesn't really look like it's a, a limited card, right? Like th this is for the black, red, and John sacrifice decks. Really, really good two drop here. But <laughs> let's move on to Banishing Light. This is a reprint. It's basically it's kind of Oblivion Ring. You know, it's two mana and a white for an enchantment. When an ETB is exile a non-land permanent, an opponent controls until Banishing Light leaves the battlefield. So this is always playable, you know. But <laughs> at the same time. Just like with like Ashiox Erasure, we talked about this. There's a lot of main deck enchantment hate. There's so much main deck enchantment hate right now, but even more so, I imagine, going into the next format. So I think Vanishing Light isn't really very safe to play, you know? But I've played Prison Realm a bunch of times, and even though this isn't a strict upgrade to Prison Realm, there have been a lot of situations where I've wanted to cast Prison Realm on a, an enchantment, you know, or an artifact. But you can't do that, so just just the ability to target any permanent type other than lands makes this fantastic in pretty much every format it's been available. But again, I'm a little bit wary of the enchantment hate. But let's move on to Omen of the Sea. I think that this is like subtly a very good magic card. This is a two mana, one and a blue, enchantment with flash. And when it enters the battlefield, you scry two, and then you draw a card. You can pay two and a blue to sack it and scry two. So, whoo, you know, we saw this during the leaks. Each color gets an omen. I want to go ahead and tell you that now. I'm not going to tell you what the other ones are until we officially get them. But each color gets one of these, and most of them look pretty good. But this is probably the best of all of them, especially given that it has flash. You know, again, flash enchantments are going to be very good for any sort of mono blue devotion deck, flash permanents in general. Like Brazen Borrower, for instance, is going to get even better in mono blue just because flash is going to be really, really good for the mono blue devotion deck if there's a real payoff. And I imagine that there is. So, again, just the fact that this is kind of two mana preordain, you know, it's, it's flash, it's instant speed. Um, scry two and then draw a card is very powerful. You know, Scry two isn't quite draw a card by itself. But the sort of shorthand for Scry 2 has always been that it's very close to draw cards. So that's been the comparison for ages now. So it's not draw 2, but it is fix your next draw extremely heavily and then make that draw. And then it sits on the battlefield until you need to, to sack it in Scry 2. That puts an enchantment in the graveyard. You know, it, it puts more cards in the graveyard for escape purposes and whatnot. So yeah, I think this is a fan-freaking-tastic omen to the point that it might actually see you know, some amount of pauper play. It's it's that good. It's a very, very good card. Now, obviously, we have access to, like, Brainstorm and other, you know, one-mana um, draw card effects in, in pauper, so I'm not sure that it's that good, but it is just extreme utility on one card at instant speed, so... I really like everything that it's doing. <laughs> Just put it that way. I think this is a very powerful card. But let's move on to some more stuff from today. We saw Wave Break Hippocamp. This is three mana, two. And I love the name. Three mana, two, and a blue for a two, two enchantment creature, Horse Fish. And whenever you cast your first spell during your opponent's turn, or each opponent's turn, you draw a card. Now, this might be really good for the Flash decks, but it's extremely hard for them to actually cast. You know? You basically give up like Sinister Sabotage and Quench and all that on your turn three. So you can get this down and then start getting value out of it on turn four. And I don't think that the Flash decks really want to do that. You know, skip Brazen Borrower or whatever on turn three or any other thing you might be able to play um, to, to play this. I just I don't think they want to do that. Although we did see at the last Mythic Championship that a lot of these Simic Flash decks were pretty much every Simic Flash deck was playing, you know, Sorcery Speed, big stuff. You know, they were playing Nissas and they were even playing like Paradise Druids in their main deck. So it's not unheard of to put Sorcery Speed stuff in your main deck in these Simic Flash decks and the Is It Flash decks. But I just, I'm not sure that this is quite good enough 
um, to, to really go into those decks. It might be a sideboard piece. This is one where like, it's really, really tough to gauge because I'm not sure that the, you know, the downside of having to play a sorcery speed card on turn three is worth the upside. But when you do get this down and it stays on the battlefield, it draws you like two extra cards. It's probably ludicrous. Like it's probably just very, very good. So I could be wrong, but I, I don't think it quite meets the bar for standard playability, but Prove me wrong. Let me know how you feel about this one and every card we've talked about down there so far, but I'm really interested in your take on this because I think it's just barely off the power level it needs to be, but I could be very wrong and I'm open to um, critique on that. So let's move on to Nick's Herald here. This is three mana, two and a green for an enchantment creature, Centaur Shaman. It's a two, three. At the beginning of combat on your turn, target enchanted creature or enchantment creature you control gets plus one, plus one and gains trample until end of turn. So this is effectively a three mana, three, four trample. Not bad, especially in limited. Now in standard, we'll probably just play Thrashing Brontodon. Although, this is easier to cast. Has the trample. That's, I mean, it's an enchantment creature, so the typing might matter a little bit more. I'm not really sure, though. I, mean, I don't think that this is super standard playable. Especially considering that in the next standard, Thrashing Brontodon is technically better because it's got two green pips for devotion. So, uh, you know, but in limited, this is actually a really, really strong creature with a hot body. And, like, it's not restricted to pumping itself. It can pump damn near anything, honestly. So I really, really like this. Um, but, again, only really for limited. I think there's just better options in standard than a card like this. So let's move on to another card that it's sort of the opposite, you know, to me. Nick's Herald looks kind of enticing until you break down what standard looks like. Tectonic Giant doesn't look actually that important when you first read it, but then you get to thinking about it, this actually looks like a very good card. Tectonic Giant, Tectonic Giant is four mana, two and two red for a three, four elemental giant. And whenever it attacks or becomes the target of a spell an opponent controls, you choose one. Either Tectonic Giant deals three damage to each opponent, or you exile the top two cards of your library. Choose one of them. Until the end of your next turn, you may play that card. Now, the sort of light up the stage wording on the second ability is really important here because it effectively creates card advantage even if it dies. Because if your opponent takes it down with a removal spell, again, you get to look at the top cards of your library and choose one to play. And you get a whole turn to play it. That's That seems really, really good to me. So even if you play this and it dies almost immediately, it creates a form of card advantage. Or, you know, if your opponent tries to kill it with a removal spell, maybe it deals the last three damage. If you have a Torbrand out, it deals five damage. <laughs> that seems decent. Um, and again, if you have a Torbrand out, it swings for five as well. But the stats are very, very low. And I actually think that considering you probably want to play Torbrand um, in mono red over this, especially in the mono red aggro variants, obviously. You know, I don't think aggro plays this, but maybe some form of mid-range deck does. And there's definitely an argument for mono red mid-range. Although if you play mono red mid-range, your own Wrath of Storm kills this, right? I mean, but Deafening Clarion doesn't, maybe. So there's all kinds, maybe a Boros mid-range deck with Deafening Clarion or something. I mean, there's, there's things to think about with this. But honestly, you want to maximize how good both abilities are. And the first ability is best in a fast deck um, that deals a lot of damage. You know, it's sort of a super scorch spitter in those decks. So again, if you do have a Torbrand out, you can attack with it, hit for five immediately. So that seems pretty good. And if they let it through, it hits for another five. So it's kind of ironically best in Torbrand decks, even though it shares a spot on the curb with Torbrand. And if you are going to play a four drop other than Torbrand, it's probably Experimental Frenzy. So I'm just, I don't know, y'all. But <laughs> Maybe in Big Red or something like that. Just the card does generate value almost no matter what but I'm not sure the stats are impressive enough to justify playing it over some other four drops you might play. You know, Gruul decks might want this, but Gruul decks have Questing Beast and all kinds of other crazy four drops. So again, this is a card where it's a question of like how good the card pool is in the four drop slot in standard. And I'm pretty sure that most of the other four drops you have access to are better than this. But then again, like both abilities are super desirable and you're not guaranteed to proc either of them, but you're somewhat guaranteed to proc them, right? You know, if, if it gets to attack, you proc the abilities. If your opponent kills it before it can attack, you still proc the abilities. So it is a decent card. But I'm, again, I'm not sure that it breaks through, but it's probably way more capable of breaking through than the last couple of cards we talked about. So let's move on. 
to Nylea's intervention. This is two green and X for a sorcery. Choose one. Search your library for up to X land cards, reveal them, put them into your hand, shuffle your library. Or, Nylea's intervention deals twice X damage to each creature with flying. So, honestly, a little bit disappointing. You know, um, maybe a sideboard card for standard, definitely a sideboard. Or a card you want to remember is in your sideboard and limited if you get it as one of your rares um, during your sealed event, during your pre-release. So, do keep it in mind, it's really good against flyers. But at the same time, I'm just, I'm a little disappointed by this. I will say the best thing about it is that it says lands, just, just lands, not basic lands or certain kinds of lands and forest cards or something, just lands. So you go get whatever you want. And that could be really good, especially if like Field of the Dead was unbanned. This might see some play, you know, at the very worst, it's like a three mana um, Sylvan scrying, right? That's... I mean, I guess you could make an argument that's not bad, but I'm still somewhat disappointed by the card. I mean, I guess if you need two more lands, you have four mana, you can cast it for, you know, X equals two, go get two lands, make sure you get your next couple of lands. I don't know, it just seems bad. You probably don't want to skip turn four for that. I guess maybe if you have a Teferi out, you can cast this at instant speed effectively because you plus one Teferi. Then maybe it's worth talking about, but uh, no, I don't... I don't think so. It would have to be a very it would have to be a very specific deck that wants this card. Um, and I'm just I'm not seeing it at right now, but I feel like this is one of those cards too. The farther back you go in terms of formats, the better it is. You know, like legacy, modern might have more of a use for this than standard. But I'm again I'm not seeing it. I may have missed something huge. <laughs> just, just let me know if there's a Buku combo down there that I haven't heard tale of yet, but Mostly I'm the standard guy around these parts, and in standard, I'm not seeing how this has too much impact right away. So I'm going to move on to Final Death. Again, we're kind of going in chronological order here. Final Death is five mana, four and a black for an instant that exiles a creature at the common level. Um, so it's decent in, you know, limited, it's good in draft and sealed. You'll play it probably at least if you get two copies, you'll probably play both of them. <laughs> Especially considering exile effects are going to be really good against escape. So keep that in mind. Very, very playable limited card, but let's move on to Drag to the Underworld, because if we're talking about removal, this is definitely the one that's more constructed worthy. This is four mana, two and two black for an instant. This spell costs X less to cast, where X is your devotion to black. Destroy target creatures. So effectively, in many cases, this is going to be just two black at instant speed for destroy target creature, which is phenomenal. It is very, it is very, very good. Um, much better than murder. Although, in some cases, like on an empty board, this is worse than murder. So, it's definitely designed in a very balanced way. But, I could definitely see this working its way, especially in a Mono Black Devotions deck. Um, this isn't, probably isn't a straight up four of, but it's at least a two of in the Mono Black Devotion decks. And Mono Black Devotion looks like a very real deck in the upcoming format. So, this just looks like a very edible piece of removal. <laughs> I'm going to eat it up. Um, and great, too, in Limited for what it's worth. You definitely play it in Limited. It's premium removal, even if you have to pay all four mana for it, you don't care. But even in Standard, there are going to be times where you don't mind paying the four mana for this so long as it gets the best creature off the table. But very often, it's going to cost you just two black because it's not hard to get, you know, two black pips for Devotion onto the battlefield. Not hard at all. So this is actually going to be easily Standard playable. I'm just not really sure the numbers that we're going to see it in. So let's move on to Stinging Lionfish. This is gorgeous art. This is two mana, one and a blue for a 2-1 element or enchantment creature, fish. And whenever you cast your first spell during each opponent's turn, you may tap or untap target non-land permanent. So this, whenever you cast your first spell during each opponent's turn, business looks to be um, a sort of a soft theme in this set. Not necessarily, you know, a, a built-in mechanic. It's not keyworded or anything, but they are putting it on multiple cards. And all of these could go very, very well in the Is It Draw 2 deck, obviously. So I really do like this in pretty much any spell-based deck. You know, you kind of get a Gadwick in a way. <coughs> Excuse me, I had to cough. I mean, you kind of get, you know, Gadwick's um, a, a text box. And that's pretty neat, but note that this could also untap your own stuff. You know, it untaps mana stuff, especially uh, Nyx Lotus. Imagine untapping Nyx Lotus with this. That seems, that seems pretty good, you know, but you can only do it during your opponent's turn. So I'm not too sure. It is pretty decent in that if you have, you know, like a fairly high toughness creature that you also want to swing with, you can swing with it and then effectively give it vigilance if you have a way to cast a spell during your opponent's turn. So there's kind of cool stuff you can do with this. Plus it's a two mana two one, so it's like playable as curve filler and limited. 
So all kinds of cool stuff about Lionfish apart from its art, but I'm not sure this breaks through in the standard either. I mean, honestly, it doesn't look super impressive. You don't want to take a turn off playing this, but if you do want to do fun stuff with Nyx Lotus, then you'll, you'll probably put it in some sort of jank dank deck. But so far, let me reload Mythic Spoiler and check out Scryfall to uh, make sure that we haven't missed anything because I'm pretty sure that there's something on Scryfall that I haven't talked about. <laughs> But so far, that appears to be just about everything today. I know that was kind of anticlimactic because I didn't actually like, oh, no, there's one more. There is. OK, I skipped it. I skipped it because I wanted to save it till the end. And you're probably already telling me what it is in the comments section. But yeah, I, I did want to save one so it wouldn't be anticlimactic. And I've done that. Here's Pelucranos Unchained. This is four mana, two, a black and a green for a zero, zero legendary zombie Hydra. Sweet creature types. And really sweet art, too. I love the color palette and the art. But Pelucranos enters the battlefield with six plus one plus one counters on it. It escapes with 12 plus one plus one counters on it instead. If damage would be dealt to Pelucranos while it has a plus one plus one counter on it, prevent that damage and remove that many plus one plus one counters on it. A lot of people are not seeing the phrase that many. So just, just keep that in mind. Now, you can pay one a black and a green. Pelucranos fights another target creature. And you can escape this out of your graveyard for four, a black and a green, and exile six other cards from your yard. So six is a pretty steep cost, but in the late game, in these Golgari and like black green slash X mid-range decks, um, they really specialize in the late game. So it really shouldn't be hard to, you know, have six cards in your graveyard on turn 12 <laughs> when you go when you go to um to escape this. And even if your opponent's board is pretty decent, you've still got an awesome creature. Now, you'll even with a lot of mana, you'll often have to wait a turn to use it. And that kind of sucks, but when you do untap with it in play, you can just, you know, shoot a creature or even two down, especially after it escapes. Jeez, you know, you've got 12 plus one plus one counters to work with. So in that case, you know, you can usually fight, if uh, you know, especially if you escaped it, you have six mana, one would assume. So, and, you know, unless you've tapped a gilded goose and you don't have food anymore you know but you you would assume you have six mana if you have enough mana to escape this so when you untap with it on the next turn just shoot down two creatures and then attack with what's left you know if you got the four or five plus one plus one counters left you can still attack and obviously if you escape this onto an empty board and you've got 12 plus one plus one counters to work with you know your opponent can even play a creature on their turn you can shoot it down and still attack for eight or something so after it escapes this is fantastic but even as just a four mana six six <laughs> one could argue that's good enough right there you know so just really good it does have the you know kind of sucky downside of yeah it's a four mana six six but then you attack with it it kills something and becomes a two two eh but still i would argue that's probably better than wicked wolf in a lot of situations plus you know you've got proliferate for what's that worth for what that's worth but i guess combine it with like heliod and suddenly, you know, you can put extra plus one, plus one counters on it that way, too. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to do this. <laughs> Vivian will put more plus one, plus one counters on it as well. I'm the four mana Vivian. So I, I, re I really like Pelucranos. I, I, again, it is the four drop argument applies here. You know, Green Black might just rather play Questing Beast. But this beats Questing Beast. <laughs> this is anti-Questing Beast. To, or no, it's not. I, I made that same mistake earlier. Remember, Questing Beast says that damage can't be prevented. So, you know, so the, you you won't be able to prevent the damage and take the counters off of it. I don't want to make that mistake again. Um, so it's actually not anti-Questing Beast tech. <laughs> but it does technically beat Questing Beast in terms of, you know, what you're getting for the mana cost. So really like it. You can't escape a Questing Beast. Questing Beast can't just like you know, indiscriminately kill other creatures on the other side of the table. You know, there's just too much that can be done with this. Even if your opponent does, you know, attack it or or block it and, and get it down on plus one, plus one counters, you know, they get it down to a one, one or two, two or something. When it eventually dies, you're just going to escape it again. You're just going to escape it. And remember that if you can escape it more than once in a game, just do that. <laughs> it's just, this card looks absolutely bonkers to me, even despite the downside of the plus one, plus one counter clause. This still looks unbelievable. There are going to be plenty of times where you escape it, you get 12 counters on it, you kill two things. And then if your opponent kills it, who cares? Just escape it again. You know, it's, it's entirely possible again, especially in these grindy um, Golgari based decks. So I think Pelucranos is probably the best card of the day all things considered, even if you do have to like wait a turn to do stuff with it, it's just a huge pile of stats that, you know, even if it does die, who cares? It can come back. So 
just nuts. Card is nuts to butts. And even though I don't have any like funny puns for it or anything, it's just it's a dumb card. It's a dumb card that I'm definitely going to be playing in all the Abzan and Soul Tide decks that I want to. So Blue Chronos just absolutely silly and maybe one of the better cards that we've seen all spoiler season so far. But that is all I have got. Where are we at on Audacity here? Oh, 48 minutes. Jeez, and I'm only cutting out a couple. So, wow. I'm ho I hope you made it all the way through with you, boy. If you did, make sure you like the video. Subscribe if you haven't done it yet. Hit the bell for the notifications. Go to TCG Player. Link in the description if you want to pre-order any of this goodness at decent prices. They got sealed product, but they also have singles. So if you want to go ahead and pre-order singles or if you just want a price guide, sort of a barometer to see where all this stuff is. Just hit the link in the description. They're good for that, even if you don't order anything. But, you know, you can also um, contribute to the Patreon, which I would really, really, really appreciate. Um, more than you know, because we're, get, we're all getting a pay cut. Um, it is officially the second of the year, so we, we, we're not going to be making as much money because COPPA just went into effect, and there's a couple of other things that are happening. So, in any case, if you like, if you like your favorite YouTubers, find their Patreon um, and donate to them. But all I ask is a dollar a month, and that'll help you vote on what decks you want to see upcoming in Theros Beyond Death, like uh, deck tech season. So do all that, and I suppose I will catch you cats later. I'm Deb from The Place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind.